This is Tsunami with a 3,000 horsepower supercharged engine. It's designed to be the fastest piston-driven airplane ever. Noted exhibition and movie pilot Corky Fornoff brings you this story. I'm here in Chino, California with Steve Hinton, who will fly Tsunami at Reno. And I've just asked Steve to give us a brief cockpit checkout. You can see the cockpit of Tsunami was built really for speed. We don't have any avionics to talk about. It's all engine and flight instruments. The uh, throttle quadrants over here on the left, everything is kind of right in front of you. You can see your throttle, propeller, and mixture control. Um, the throttle, for instance, uh, 60 inches on this engine and 3,000 RPM is what the engine was designed to operate at originally. Uh, but we're capable of 110 plus and 3,800. Um, where originally the engine at 61 inches and 3,000 would put out 1,500 horsepower. At uh, that power setting right there is a little over 3,000 horsepower. Of course, we, we don't intend to run it there, but it is capable of running there. Uh, the communications right here for ground crew and uh, race control. This is what keys the mic. Manifold pressure, RPM, airspeed. We fly about 130 knots on final. And we race at around 380 knots indicated. And at Reno, that'd be good for 445, 450 mile an hour laps. Um, our coolant temperature and coolant spray bar, and what this is, uh, the uh, spray bar sprays water across the radiator and it allows us to operate at all this extra horsepower without overheating the engine. And we can pump up to uh, six gallons a minute across the radiator. This is a, called a three-in-one gauge, and this keeps monitor of our fuel pressure, oil pressure, and oil temperature. Uh, oil temperature we can control with a spray bar and keep it where we want it. And um, fuel pressure, uh, we make sure it's operating high. If you get fluctuating fuel pressure, you could be cause of a detonation and backfire with a lean mixture at that high power setting. Um, as you can see, everything's kind of gauged to be looking out, so we have a really important immediate problem instruments, right? up: coolant temperature, oil pressure, all kind of right in view as we're looking out of the cockpit. So everything is just built where you can just kind of touch it and feel for it without having really to look at it. Tell you what, we're going to get out of your hair, give you time to get this thing all set to go, and we'll see you in a month in Reno. Okay. Thanks, pal. Thanks. Reno 87 arrives with the fans anticipating the fastest air races ever seen. Qualifying is completed, and the results are stunning. Strega. A highly modified P-51 has qualified at 466 miles an hour, a new world's record, and Tsunami has qualified at 464, reportedly with quite a bit more throttle available. Heat races are scheduled for today and Saturday. Then on Sunday, the eight-lap gold race will decide it all. Frankly, a lot of people are wondering, is this Tsunami's year? One of the dreams I've always had is to build the world's fastest prop-driven aircraft. And this, uh, this dream was kind of nurtured when I was involved with Daryl Greenemeyer and uh, Steve Hitton with the Red Baron. So that was kind of the uh, manure for the seeds that were planted earlier. When uh, John Sandberg and I got together at Tonopah for the world speed record attempt with the Red Baron, we started talking about a small, lightweight airplane that would be wrapped around a very reliable engine, which turned out to be the Rolls-Royce Merlin. When we uh, started uh, talking about this airplane, it was just conceptual at first. At the Reno races in 1979, I brought some drawings of what the airplane might look like. At that point, he says, well, when can we get started? Well, I said, well, geez, I don't know. It's uh, <laughs> sounded like a big proposition to me, but we started building the airplane, all the tooling and so forth. It took about a year and a half just to establish the tooling. When we started building the aircraft, everything just went along very smoothly. It, it, of course, you don't really find out all the problems until they start to assemble it. I would say the, the biggest uh, labor-intensive part of the aircraft was getting the landing gear to fit in the aircraft. We have a hole in the wing. Now we have an existing landing gear, not, an air, not, not a gear that's designed for the airplane, but an existing aircraft uh, landing gear, which essentially is a Piper Aerostar with uh, Learjet brakes and wheels. And we, tr we had to mount this in space and actually get it to fit inside the wing and to swing properly so that it would clear everything. So we had to build tooling to simulate the trunnions of the landing gear. And this took, I would say, about all of three weeks to actually do. And it, we probably retracted the gear 200 times by hand. <laughs> My partner has huge arm muscles now. It's a, but I would say that was probably the most single labor-intensive program uh, uh, involved with Tsunami. 
Everything else uh, seemed to go relatively smooth. It was just labor intensive and took a long time, especially if you want to do it right. Now that we have the airplane up in Reno, uh, we have uh, done some flight testing since we've been up here. Everything is really matching the numbers. In fact, it's uh, exceeding the numbers that we predicted for the airplane, and we're very happy with it. So uh, as long as we still have what we think uh, is systems maturity, we should win the race. Well, that's why we're here in the first place. <laughs> oh, the real competition for us out here today is uh, obviously Strega, which went very fast in qualifying. Uh, Dreadnought has been dominating the races for the last few years, and it's a, it's a very, very, very strong contender. Uh, Lyle Shelton's with, with Rare Bear has come along uh, very strongly this year, and we're looking at some heavy competition from him. Uh, and of course, uh, Stiletto has always been a heavy contender. We plan on going after the speed record in July of 1988, probably at Bonneville. I hope to set the record at about 520 to 525 miles an hour. I'll be doing that personally. Uh, the racing is being done by Steve Hinton. Well, today's Friday. Uh, we qualified second at uh, 464 miles an hour. Uh, we think we've got a lot left in the airplane. We qualified at the power setting that we set out uh, to qualify with. Racing strategy is going to be to try to stay out in front every race. Uh, we're expecting a lot of pretty stiff competition from everybody, especially the Dreadnought race number eight. He'll be the one to beat. He's got the one with a track record. He'll be able to probably reliably go fast every single lap. So I'm not really sure what their strategy is yet at this time, but I have a feeling they'll be kind of clipping on our heels the whole time, trying to wait for us to make a mistake. Well, as far as uh, what we did this year, preparation, the primary modifications we did to our airplane, we had to add additional oil cooling for the engine, uh, larger engine, the addition of the Pratt & Whitney 4360, the uh, Sky Raider prop that we modified, and a uh, tall tail to keep the airplane going straight under high power. Uh, we feel that uh, we can run 450 and run the whole race and have some reliability, and uh, we have a good chance at, you know, at another victory to be a third time national champion. But uh, some of the other airplanes here, like again, Tsunami, has exhibited uh, some very fast speeds in the 460s. And in my opinion, they do have reliability at those speeds. What we started out with here was a uh, North American P-51D model that was manufactured uh, in 1945. We took the airplane and completely stripped it down to uh, no components whatsoever in it. And uh, then we started modifying on our uh, way, building it back uh, for a full-blown uh, air racer. We've uh, changed our scoop, uh, the air intake scoop that uh, lets the air uh, flow across the radiator. We've tucked it completely way up. Uh, we've modified the canopy, cut it way down. We've uh, changed the angle of incidence on the tail, the whole tail plane. Uh, we've smoothed up the wings uh, where they're just like glass. Uh, the rest of it really has to do with the engine, which is a highly de uh, development type engine. It's taken us quite a while to really get it on board the way we want, and uh, it seems like it's working out real good for us now. Our strategy for the race here at Reno is, uh, of course, to qualify very good, which we did. Uh, we qualified at 466 miles per hour around the uh, 9.2 mile course, which uh, was a new record. Uh, we want to run nice and hard uh, all week long. We want to, uh, if our engine uh, is uh, looking like it would like to lay down on us, we want to know it early. In other words, we want to run good and sound each day so that uh, we can take all the engine vital signs after each race. If it starts to lay down a little bit, we want to know that so we can repair it. We want to be in top form for the uh, goal race on Sunday. Just this last year, we've uh, done a cleanup uh, on the airplane by reducing uh, engine cooling drag oil cooling drag, we have uh, slicked up the wings, we've, we've uh, straightened uh, the wings, we've made uh, the airplane slicker where it just slides through the air quite a bit uh, faster. Uh, we've uh, got a rare propeller that gives us about 10 knots. We've picked up at least 15 knots on the airframe just this last year from, a, from a doing this, a lot of small modifications. Stiletto is a highly modified P-51 uh, that was built only for one purpose, and that's air racing, and to be the national champion at the Reno Air Races. The wings have been clipped approximately 10 feet. They're now 28 feet long, vice the 38 feet. The radiator's been moved off of the belly, which you notice on most Mustangs have a belly scoop. The radiators have been moved into the wings to reduce the drag. 
we think we can run the full race at a fairly low power and still be ahead of everybody. Well, the time has come for the talking to stop and the flying to start. Today's gold heat race is six laps, and it looks like nobody's going to be holding back. Every pilot is going to be pushing to see who's fast and who can last. Strega and Dreadnought jump out to an immediate lead, with Tsunami trailing in third spot. With lap speeds in the 450 mile per hour range, this heat race is already the fastest race ever run at Reno. And this is just a shakedown. Steve Hinton reports that Tsunami is having some sort of a temperature problem. He limits power to avoid engine damage. Strega takes the race, leading wire to wire. Dreadnought is second, and Tsunami is third. As Tsunami is rolled back into the pits, the crew is concerned. Why is the oil temperature so high? The prime suspect is radiator cooling. It won't go down, it won't go through the radiator. It's going forward, blowing out this seam, mixing with the oil fog, and turning the peanut butter back here. The whole Steve, can you give us a recap of the race you just flew? Sure, yeah, well, the uh, Friday first heat race, uh, we started the race, power setting we wanted to run, and uh, basically we're feeling everybody out, and we went to kind of advance our position. And uh, it's going to require just a couple little changes on the airplane, though. Uh, we're very happy with the airplane, though. That was a good test we, we had nothing with it. Nothing really major. Though. Oh, nothing major at all, no. If it was Sunday, it would have been a different story. But uh, I'm trying to stay conservative, so to speak, you know, with the airplane so we can uh, come back and talk about it instead of have to fix it. Tsunami's crew has had a long night, but they think the cooling problem has been fixed, and they're ready for today's heat race. This race, like every other unlimited race at Reno, is paced and started by Mr. Bob Hoover. Bob, we know you have a great responsibility in starting the races and caring for the safety and if there are any emergencies. What we'd like to know is, is what specifically do you look for to start the race? And what do you look for in the pilots to know how to handle the safety aspect if there is a problem? Well, Corky, the, the thing we're really interested in more than anything else is just what you stated, safety. And uh, the idea is to get them down at chute in an orderly manner and turn them loose with a reasonable separation. And from that point on, my responsibility is to talk the fellas down. I'm sitting in a calm, collected cockpit with no concerns about anything except helping someone out so they need it. So if you can, it, it, that's the fun I get out of it, is helping and, and assisting people. Chuck, we know that you've been here for a few days and enjoying the show. We'd like to know who you think's gonna walk off with the goal. There's a lot of luck in this mechanical strain that they put on these airplanes and it depends an awful lot just the integrity of the engine how well it holds together when they really run it at max power if we know that you, you've watched it from the pits and we understand you went out to the pylons uh, what was your view from the pylon well i had an, an invite to go out of the pylon and look at it and i didn't think too much about it when, when we went out there but i tell you what i was standing there wasn't really expecting what's going to happen i tell you what I, I swear they were flew right between my ankles and the power and the speed and the precision with which they came by was just incredible. It totally blew me away. I haven't seen anything like that. I uh, wish I could find words to describe it. Well, the P-38, you know, is a very historic airplane and was really built as a pursuit airplane to shoot down enemy aircraft. As a racer, it's delightful to fly, but it's not the fastest airplane on the track. Bob, why don't you tell us about this unique airplane? Well, it's a, it's a Yak-11 made in Czechoslovakia. It originally had 700 horse, and we've converted it slightly to 2,500 and skinned it. And it's a fun airplane. It started out being a trainer, and we're going to try to make a racer out of it. I don't know whether we're going to make it or not, but we're trying. Mr. Provorizny, could you tell us what the significance is of air races in general aviation? Well, there's a very close parallel. Most all of the people that are involved in uh, this sort of thing uh, are general aviation, general aviation people and uh, it offers the public a great opportunity to get closer to aviation. As we well know, most of the major airports are fenced uh, in and the people are fenced out. It offers our public uh, a taste of the real part of aviation. What we look for before a race is specific amounts of uh, spray bar, uh, ADI, and the fuel load. 
before we call anything that has been looked at and is questionable uh, is brought to my attention or to Jack's attention because uh, we can all miss things. And the confidence of the pilots what we have to maintain. If Steve has any question mechanically about the aircraft, uh, we show him whatever we've found. We don't hide anything from Steve because his confidence uh, is, uh, has to be protected. Uh, if he doesn't have confidence in the crew, uh, he can't fly a good course. And I trust Steve, uh, and he trusts me. I trust the crew, and we all have to work as a team. Uh, each individual can't do it alone. He and I have a little, a little thing about God, and I say, as I told the other people, I say, the last thing I do, I call it up, and I say a little prayer to God. I said, don't let Steve get hurt. We can always replace the airplane. And it worked so far. Well, today's Saturday. It's our second day of racing. Um, our strategy today will be like it was yesterday. We want to be out in front, even though we weren't yesterday. But um, yesterday was really our first good race we've ever had on the airplane, and we learned a little bit more about it. And today, I think we'll go a little bit faster, and uh, if they can keep up with us, fine. If they can't, fine. Um, yesterday, we started out, and I was a little amazed that Strega was holding its position out in front. I, was, almost, I held back there a little bit because I really expected to see some parts coming off his airplane. Just, I know how hard he must have been running his engine. And like we had talked before, a real tribute to those guys to uh, be able to perfect that engine. They're really doing a great job keeping that thing alive. And, uh, so we're going to count on them being there on Sunday, where yesterday, really, I, I didn't think they were going to do that. Anyway, today we expect to go a little faster, and we're very confident still. We're going to run a little harder than we did yesterday, see if we can keep them honest. We'd like to run uh, faster than we did yesterday, about till five, six miles an hour. We had a little problem with oil cooling yesterday, but that's resolved now, so I think we'll be all right. The engines fire up and the fans are ready. It's another six-lap heat race, and the Tsunami team would like nothing better than to show the world what their ship can really do when everything's working right. But of course, there's a few other people with the same idea, and it's clear that being able to go the distance is a key concern. Once more, Strega takes the lead in the first lap, followed by Fredman and Tsunami in third. It's a carbon copy of yesterday's race. From the spray bar vapor trail, it's pretty clear that Steve is running more power, but so are the others. Lap speeds are running about 450 miles an hour, and the first three places are within seconds of each other. The big brown motor dreadnought keeps up the pressure on Strega. But to no avail, Strega holds the lead. Hinton presses harder, increasing power settings, increasing speed. But the cooling problem won't be resolved. And rather than risking damage to Tsunami's engine, on the last lap, Steve pulls out of the race. Strega takes the checkered, leading wire to wire again. But Dreadnought is just a fraction of a second behind. Steve's landing appears uneventful. But turning off the runway, he radios the crew that he has a problem. A major problem. The landing gear has collapsed. Just a small casting let go. One tiny part. But the damage is considerable. And Tsunami is clearly out of the race this year. I don't think I even started the turn yet when I went. That real quick, but it didn't go stop. Such a small piece. But such a big problem. The 
good news is that the spar appears to be unbroken. Tsunami can be fixed. And in due time, she will race again. But for now, it's time to get her into a nice hangar. Lovingly, gently, the crew cradles their baby and heads for home. Hinton explains what happened. Uh, pulled out of the race, cautionary pull out, and uh, came into land, and as I was rolling out, uh, just getting ready to turn around and taxi back, the gear collapsed, the right gear. So it was really pretty anticlimactic, if you know what I mean. It was. Yeah. Of course, you could say that's the way it goes, but I mean, it's such a big group effort, you know? I mean, just everybody's just, you know, we wait all year to do this, and then we come out here the day before the Bane event. Things are looking so good, too, and going so good, and you just hate to, no nothing's in the bag. You're looking at a winner, not this year at Reno, but it'll be back and it'll be back strong. We have four main contenders today in this race. Unfortunately, Tsunami won't be in it. The first airplane to watch, of course, is Strago. Strago's sitting there with a the Merlin engine, which has amazed everybody that stayed together, and it's the fastest Mustang that's ever run anywhere. The second airplane is Dreadnought. Dreadnought is sitting there with a the big 4360 engine, very reliable, very strong. The third airplane is Rare Bear, another one with a big round engine, a very reliable power plant. The fourth airplane is Stiletto. Stiletto out of Florida is a highly modified Mustang, again though with the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. That's always had problems staying and going the distance. Next to that, the fifth airplane, we have the Super Corsair, another round engine, very reliable. It will go the distance and has one here before. To win this race today, you're going to have to go better than 475 miles an hour down the straightaway. And the overall time and speed is going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 460 miles an hour. We're going to turn and burn. Everything's fine. Yeah. Uh, should be a good race. Uh, weather's beautiful. Engine's running strong. Any worries? No worries at all. First thing we got to do, though, is take the start. We've got some problems that have been coming in a little later in the race. I hope we've licked them, but we're going to do, it, do our best. And if we don't win it this year, we're coming back and we're going to win it next year. I, I don't know what to think, really. You know, the Dreadnought is still the one to beat as far as I'm concerned. You know, he's right there, right with Strega. If Strega holds together, it, it appears to me that he might have the edge. But on the other hand, uh, Dreadnought might have a little left. We're just going to have to watch and find out. They're both really smart pilots, so I think it's going to be really fun to watch. Thank I can't you, believe I'm saying that. A whole year of preparation finally comes down to just eight laps around the course at Reno. All the tricks come out of the bag now, and the basic strategy is to go fast and don't break. Under the direction of Bob Hoover, the pilots carefully line up for the start of the race. And they're off. In the first lap, Strega again takes the lead, followed by Dreadnought, Red Bear, and Stiletto. In the second lap, as they round pylon six, Dreadnought passes Strega and pulls ahead. It appears there's more power in that big round 4360 than Brickard has let on. And so it goes, lap after lap. Dreadnought dominates the race. But in the middle of lap seven, Tiger DeStefani in Strega makes his move and passes Dreadnought, okay, now, pulling away. Line, we'll have our on them. 
This seventh lap is timed by many at over 469 miles an hour, a one-lap record. Rickard's only hope now is his bulletproof durability. But as he streaks through the final lap, Estefani proves that Strega is bulletproof too. Winning speed is over 452 miles an hour. This is the fastest race ever flown at Reno. Tiger Destefani, pilot and owner of Strega from Bakersfield, California, has done it. And coming back down to Earth, he knows he's won the gold in the fastest race on Earth. I can't believe it. It, it, it hung in there and did it. Yeah, I think that both of us, uh, he was 452, I think we were over 450. Yeah, that's what they were just saying. Yeah, no, I think um, we're pretty proud of the performance of Dreadnought, and we're just dazzled by the performance of Strega. Now, they want to know how that little mouse motor outrun that big round. <laughs> oh, boy, uh, those roared. elephants hate Mises to pieces. <laughs> Tiger was right. He said the mouse motor would hang together. Striga did it. The race ends. Everybody's going home, and you can hear them all thinking to themselves, just wait till next year. We had a lot more. <laughs> just like to say, can't wait till next year.